Hello and welcome back. This is um, another lecture for the uh, Simulating Neurobiological Systems course taught in the uh, fall term of 2021 at the University of Waterloo. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, so we're sort of, again, we're through the core chunk of the course. Now we're sort of into applications and interesting offshoots um, and different directions you can take the work in this. Um, and the particular topic for today is time. Um, so we've done stuff about, um, I can build a function where the output is um, a function of its input. Fine, that's just a set of connections. We've also done something like memory in that, say, the, um, the integrator example that I was showing with the, um, the simple brain that we generated in the last class, where it needed to remember um, uh, where it is. So it sort of it knew its own motion, and so it could sort of keep track of, of its actual location uh, by computing the integral of its velocity. Um, and that's one type of memory. Um, and that, so that, that's sort of, uh, okay, we can do some sorts of computations over time. What I want to do in this class is say, let's be a little bit more specific about um, what sorts of things we might want to do in time. And in particular, knowing your recent history seems like a useful thing. Um, and there's all sorts of behavioral data that, you know, people can, um, um, you know, or do have fairly immediate access to things like, okay, things that I saw within the last second or two um, seem to be um, um, somehow stored uh, in memory, um, and we can ma make use of those and and find patterns in them and things like that um, in a way that, um, you know, things that happened four hours ago um, would maybe not be encoded in the, in the same sort of way. Um, what's another concrete example of that? Uh, well, let's do, well, here's a fairly abstract, um, but sort of here's the, the general version of that. Um, let's say I've got an input, which is this dotted line coming through this thing here, um, and it's changing over time. Um, and what I would really like to do is at any point in time, can I remember what the value was a second ago, a half second ago, a quarter of a second ago, there's going to be some limit as to how far back I can remember it, um, but I'd like to remember all the data within that window. Okay. Um, that's sort of what's being shown um, in the background here. So for instance, um, uh, when these different colors are different amounts of delay, the brightest color over here is remembering, okay, that's, you know, what was my, you know, uh, what was the input one second ago? So I'm currently at this point in time, and I would like to be able to decode out the function, oh, what was my input a second ago? Um, when I was at this point in time, I could decode out the function, what was my input a half second ago? Or something like that. Okay. Um, there's nothing... Um, uh, yeah, so, so we might want to do anything within that window, but I'm, say, perhaps might not be able to say, okay, at this point in time, what was my input three seconds ago? Um, what we're plotting here is actually what we will end up with at the end of the course, or sorry, not at the end of the course, at the end of this lecture, um, is this is, we can build a neural model um, that will behave exactly like this, where the output function is all of these values. And so the output at any point in time is, well, what was the value right now? What's the value 0.1 seconds ago? What was the value 0.2 seconds ago? 0.3 seconds ago? 0.4 seconds ago? And so on and so forth. So all of that data is being stored somehow. And again, it's just using the same techniques that we were using in class. How are we going to do that? So I'm hoping that there's the, that, that argument there is that this, that we can sort of see that this might be a useful thing. Um, for example, it might be useful for, hey, if I'm listening to someone speaking, um, when I'm hearing the sounds they're making right now at the end of the word, I probably still need to encode the information about what the sounds were at the beginning of the word. Well, that would seem to be useful. <laughs> Um, so that I can, you know, interpret what the word was. Cool. So, what do what does this really mean? So, one, there's going to be a, two big steps that we're going to we're going to make in this class. So, one of them is this question of, hold on a second. Now I'm 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 now I'm trying to represent 
an infinite amount of information. If I really want to encode what was my input over the last second, if I really want to encode what that value was changing over time, technically that's an infinite amount of information. If I wanted that to just work for any input whatsoever. Um, just because time is continuous. Right? Um, so what am I going to do about that? Um, so, you know, so, so for instance, um, so, so at the moment I'm trying to break down the problem. All I want to do right now is let's just focus on representation. Can how do I represent? You know, forget about how the system learn or you know remembers the information over time. How in the world can we even store an infinite amount of information in some neurons? We clearly, can't store an infinite amount. We've got to do something, especially since all we've talked about so far is representing a vector in neurons. Right? Um, but if the, if you know if this is the past history of my signal, um, how how am I going to store this? Um, and one possibility. Um, is just to say, well, look, yes, technically there's an infinite amount of points along here. Um, and so then, you know, I could just have an infinite dimensional input to my neurons um, and just have, you know, let the dimensionality go to infinity. Um, that's probably going to cause some problems somewhere. So instead of letting it go to infinity, we'll just let it go to a large number. All right, so I might just simply say, cool, all right, my, you know, I'll take this curve and I will sample it, I don't know, a thousand times. So I've got a thousand different data points coming along here. And that's just a big giant vector. And I know how to represent vectors in neurons. I just go ahead and, and put them in, into the neurons and everything's fine. All right? Um, it's just a fairly high dimensional one. Um, that is a totally possible approach. Um, and that's a good, perfectly sort of general way of doing things. One caveat that's going to come up if you ever try doing that um, is in, if you have some sort of like really, really high dimensional smooth input, um, when it comes time to choose encoders, randomly choosing encoders is going to be a bad idea. Right? Um, so because if you if you did that and then you randomly choose your encoders, um, then each neuron is going to end up being sensitive to just some random pattern of these thousand values. Okay. Um, and it's going to turn out that's just not going to generalize well, um, or you're going to need... Um, um, yeah, it's it, it just turns out that that doesn't do a very good job of representing the type of functions that you're likely to put into it. Because I'm likely to put in smooth functions. I'm not likely to put in functions where each millisecond it's a totally wildly different value. Right. Um, if you are in those sorts of domains, um, then uh, we would probably end up doing something like what biology does, um, in that what you want to do is you start choosing your encoders um, by uh, maybe I just have, you know, um, um, I will have neurons that are, say, sensitive. Um, to particular points in time. So, um, and this is also something that you see that we end up seeing in biology, um, where, um, uh, yeah, where you will have a neuron that is sensitive not just to this point in time, but maybe this and this and this, whoops, um, but sort of nearby ones. What that's going to translate to in terms of encoders is that when you generate your encoders, fine, it's going to be a thousand dimensional vector again. But you'll generate something like I don't know, like a Gaussian bump that jumps goes up like that and over for one neuron. So one neuron might have that as an encoder, and another neuron might have this as an encoder, another neuron might have this as an encoder, um, and so on. Okay. So you'll have to generate your encoders differently, um, but that's fine. Okay. Um, one fun trick that sort of harkens back to the previous video. Um, is if you have a whole bunch of curves and you want to know what encoders would be good for those particular curves, um, you can just take your curves and do singular value decomposition on them and that'll tell you um, what sorts of neurons or what sorts of encoders would be really good at representing those. 
okay, for the same sorts of reasons as what we talked about um, in the last video. Um, okay, so that's one sort of semi-possibility. Um, um, that you might want to sample this a lot. Now, of course, if this is, we, we might be a little bit more intelligent about this. Um, if this is a smoothly varying curve, and it doesn't vary very much, then I, maybe I don't have to sample it very very often. Right? Maybe I only have to sample it four times. Or, okay, and um, if I sample it four times and I do some sort of linear interpolation between those points, yeah, it's sort of an okay representation of that function. Um, but of course, there's other ways of doing interpolation uh, between these points. Um, and, um, you know, there's... So there's ways of, of generating that data. Um, interestingly, um, there's the standard Nyquist, you know, if you have more samples, um, then there is, um, then you're gonna do a better job of matching the curve, no matter which method you're using. Um, and one fun thing is that, yes, there is a proof that if you know the bandwidth, you know, what the maximum frequency of your signal is, you can know how many samples you need. Right? It's, Turns out to be two times the uh, bandwidth, um, and that will that will sort of ideally do things. Um, yeah. So okay. So that's an example of actually doing that. If if you actually know the bandwidth of your signal and you can actually choose the correct amount, um, and if you choose the samples, and you know there are reconstruction methods that are guaranteed to if you have enough samples, perfectly re recreate um, your original image. And that's just the Nyquist sampling theorem stuff. However, that's not quite what we're going to do here. All right. Um, that's, it's, it's um, uh, doing that mathematically, um, uh, you know, doing this, that perfect sampling approach um, hasn't turned out to be a, um, a method that sort of has lent itself to particularly biological functions. So, um, Maybe that's something that could be explored more, but it hasn't been the path that, um, that we've often gone. Instead, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Instead of sampling, let's think about different basis spaces. Um, what do I mean by different basis spaces? Um, what we're going to do... Uh, yeah, let me, let me cut back over here. So... I will definitely say, since I'm going through this stuff fairly quickly in this particular video, I will highly recommend checking, checking out the lecture notes um, uh, for this, because it'll actually go into a little bit more detail about um, exactly what we mean by um, by these different sampling approaches. Um, it's also got some nice examples of functions that really are infinitely, or that sampling is going to be a problem for. Um, Da, 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 da. Right, but we have you know, a little bit more details um, on those sampling theorems and so on. Um, again, that's not quite the approach um, that, we're, that we end up finding is all that more useful. Here's what we're going to do instead. Instead of sampling the function, we're going to choose some basis space and then instead of representing the samples in our neural ensemble, we are going to represent the coefficients of that basis space. What do I mean by that? Um, any function can be approximated by taking some set of basis functions, taking each of those basis functions, um, okay, maybe not every function, but assuming I've got a good set of basis functions, um, then I can take these basis functions, weight each one by some amount, and add that all up, all right? And that'll give me an approximation of my function. Um, so that um, so that should work fine. Okay. And then all we need to do, if we have some fixed set of bases, then all we need to represent in our neural ensemble is those coefficients. And those coefficients, that's just a vector. And we've already got all of our code all set up for represent ve representing vectors in neurons. Okay. Um, so basically all we're doing is we're just saying, okay, we're going to do exactly what we've been doing before, 
um, I'm just going to represent this vector, um, and then when I'm using it, I can sort of um, uh, take that vector to mean the particular curve that I'm interpreting, that I, that I want it to be. Right, so what's an example of that? So we've already seen some examples in this sort of direction. Um, the Fourier basis, all right, we've been, you know, um, you can take a set of sine waves um, and cosine waves um, and add them up and approximate a function with those. And that's, that's what the Fourier transform is. It's taking us in and out of, um, from, um, yeah, from, from that sequence of data to um, the coefficients that represent that data in the Fourier space. Okay. Um, as with all of these basis spaces, um, as we increase the number of bases, so that is, as we increase the number of these samples, um, or as we increase the number of, of basis functions that we're using, we can get better, or assuming they're well chosen, we can get better and better approximating a function. So, um, let's do the, the Fourier basis as an, as an example. Um, so if we just had one term in the Fourier series, which seems like a really weird thing to do, um, the, the, you know, the first one is just that function. It's just the one function. Okay, so if I want to try to approximate a curve by doing a weighted sum of just that line, fine, okay, this is the best job I could do. Right? I can just, you know, okay, I can scale this by some amount that'll get this vaguely close. Okay. Of course, if I have two, here's the first two um, Fourier curves. Oh, that didn't help all that much. So basically, I'm, again, I'm trying to find weights where um, uh, I could do a weighted version of the, uh, a scaled version of the blue line plus the scaled version of the orange line in order to match um, this curve. That doesn't help all that much. Up to three, and eh, we can do a little better. Four, five, six, oh, right, six. So now we've got six basis functions, and we can do some weighted sum of those basis functions, and then we get this. Okay, and again, that's just that's just this sort of function here. Okay. It's another way of thinking about what we're doing when we do a Fourier transform, is we're converting from this time series um, into this sort of representation. Okay. Um, but of course, that's only one basis space. We could choose the cosine basis, which is pretty similar to the Fourier basis, it's just sort of scaled versions, where we're only using the cosines rather than uh, the sines and the cosines. Um, cool, that can also work. It's just a different basis space, fine. There's also kind of an interesting thing here. Well, th this math, uh, okay, so so one interesting question comes up is wh where do I get these weights from? Right. Um, well, that's actually the same problem we've been doing with solving for decoders, right? When we, we've been solving for decoders, we've been in the situation where these phi terms are the outputs of my neurons, and I would like to find a weighted sum of the outputs of the neurons that will approximate some function that I want. Um, it's the same math <laughs> um, in order to find these, these sorts of coefficients. Um, and indeed, we can use rectified linear neurons, say, as a basis space. Why not? Right. right, and that's sort of what we're doing with the neural engineering framework, um, is we're, um, you know, arguably with any sort of neural network, is that what we're doing is that that hidden layer of neurons, the neurons, the, the, the neural activations are becoming some sort of basis space, and we are approximating functions with that basis. So just highlighting that just as sort of there's a commonality between what we're doing here and what we have been doing with, with neurons. Um, and looks like I've got one more example here where I'm using the Legendre polynomials, uh, which are basically x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, but not quite that simple. Um, but, um, so there, okay, that's x to the zero. Yep, all right, that's that function. Um, that's x to the one, fine. That's x squared, okay. Shifted and scaled a little bit. Um, the next one isn't quite x cubed, it's x cubed plus some, uh, or minus some x squared terms or, or minus some x terms um, in order to get that shape. 
and this shape, and this shape. Okay. But again, it's just another basis space. Um, and again, I can go ahead and go ahead and, and create these things. Um, yeah. So, why would you want to use some of these rather than others? Different curves are going to, you know, be fit better with with uh, with different bases. Um, and it's going to turn out by the end of this lecture that the Legendre basis has some nice properties that are going to mean that we are we're going to end up using that one a little bit more. Um, I will also note. Um, and I think this is a coincidence, although now that I'm saying that out loud, um, I'd be really curious about staring, uh, breaking down the math of it. Um, again, in the previous lecture, the Legendre polynomials showed up because when we took a whole bunch of neuron models and we did singular value decomposition on them in order to see um, what it is that those neurons would be good at approximating, um, we got the Legendre polynomials. Um, or something very similar to them. So that's, and that seemed to happen for a bunch of different neuron models. So I think there's there's more math that could be explored there. In any case, this gives us a general method for representing continuous time signals. Clearly, we're not going to represent an infinite amount of information. Um, but what we can do is we can simply say, oh, all right, um, let's represent, uh, let's choose a basis space and then represent the coefficients in that basis space. And now all of a sudden we can use all of the tools that we've seen in uh, the course so far in order to represent, um, you know, a continuous signal. Okay. This doesn't have to be time. I will definitely point out these continuous signal things. This doesn't have to be time. This might be space that I'm representing. This could be a two-dimensional space. I can do a similar thing in order to represent um, images. All right, that would be just sort of a two-dimensional version of this. Um, I would choose some basis space, and I can do coefficients in that basis space. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so this is just a general technique. Okay, so this is that's how we're going to be representing a signal over time um, using vectors. But how... How, how am I going to use that to do what my original problem was? Because my original problem, if we go all the way back here, was I want a network where I feed in this dotted line signal and it gives me out what was the past history of that signal over the last second. So the only thing I've done so far in this course, in this lecture, is I've sort of said, oh, okay, I can imagine that it'll be a, it'll be a group of neurons. It'll represent some vector M or what? You know, it'll represent some vector, and that vector will be the um, coefficients of some basis space. Um, and so then given those coefficients, I can know, okay, well, what was my value over the last second? But how am I going to build that network? Like, what computation is that network doing in order to convert this dotted, this single line input into that... Um, that basis space because after all the way what we've been doing it here for the graphs that I've been showing here the way I've been getting these numbers is I've been doing if I've been doing least squares minimization in order to find well what are the best numbers that let me convert these um, convert this curve into a weighted sum of these curves and that doesn't seem like something that neurons should do on the fly that seems weird so what are we going to do instead Well, so um, this was an outstanding problem um, that was sort of identified by uh, Aaron Volker, one of the PhD students who, of, of Chris Eismith, who just graduated. Um, and so he was playing around with this problem and went with the following line of reasoning. I want to remember all the data over an entire window. Um, in order to, you know, and, and I want that window to keep being updated over time. So, you know, um, uh, fine, at, one, at some moment t, I know all of my past history of information back to t minus theta, but then um, at t plus epsilon, I now know everything 
back to theta, you know, t plus epsilon minus theta. Right. So this is a continually updating little window. Um, and if it's good enough to remember the value, so, so I want it to remember all the values within that window. But I also know that in order for that thing to work, I just need to focus on, do I remember what happened theta seconds ago? Right? Because if I know what would happen to theta seconds ago and I can keep updating that, um, then in order to for that update to keep working, I have to also know all the data from um, between theta seconds ago and now. Um, so that's just an argument that I can simplify my task to a, a sort of a concrete example of, I just want a function whose output is whatever the value was theta seconds ago. Because as long as that function works, as long as that function always works, then, um, then it must somehow have encoded in it all the data from now back to theta seconds ago. Fine, that's sort of okay. Well, how does that help? Well, how that helps is now I can write down that function. That's a clear function that I can write down. Um, so that is, um, whoops, let's uh, just scroll down to where we are. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, oh, we don't actually have that written here. Cool, let me pull up, uh, let me just write out that function again. Um, so if I was gonna write that function in math, right, that would be the function y of t equals x of t minus theta. Right, that's the function I want to approximate. Why does writing like that help? Well, because again, if I vaguely remember some of my math classes, or depending on which math classes I've taken, um, I can take a Laplace transform of this. So this this is a thing that there's a nice Laplace transform for. Okay, and that is um, so the the transfer function here. So um, uh, what's the right way of writing this? So um, what is this? Y of s over, uh, uh, yeah, so y of s equals uh, x of s e to the negative s theta. Okay, the other way of writing that is the transfer function h of s equals y over x of s <laughs> equals e to the negative s theta. All right, it's one of those things that's just in your textbook. This is what the Laplace transform of a delay is. Why does that help at all? So the cool step that, uh, again, that, that sort of, Aaron, so Aaron's PhD thesis sort of explores this in great detail um, is this is a horrible function. This is just, well, I mean, it's got some nice math properties, but it's just annoying to work with. Um, one interesting property of things in the Laplace domain is that if you can write them as um, ratios of polynomials, it's sort of a yeah so, yeah so so if, if if you can write that as a ratio of polynomials um, then we can convert that into um, a differential equation All right. um, and that's just one of the fun things that you can always do um, now this is not a ratio of polynomials but there's this technique so you might be familiar, so this was not a technique I remembered at all, but I did vaguely remember Taylor series approximations, right? There was a thing in math class where you can take an arbitrary function and then you, you convert it into an infinite sum of polynomials. So I could convert that into, um, you know, something like AS plus BS squared plus CS cubed plus dot, 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 right? You can do some sort of, um, uh, infinite um, 
uh, ex yeah, infinite writing out of this. Right? I can do the same thing with ratios. Um, it's called a Pate approximation instead of a Taylor series approximation. Fine. Um, and I can do that to this function. And if I do that, I get this particular differential equation. Uh, that's right, that should be an x dot of t there, sorry. Um, so I get a particular differential equation that says, so this should be dx dt is ax plus bu, u is my input, x is my internal variable. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got a whole bunch of bad notation going on here. So with the notation in, in, the, in the notes, u is our input, and x is that vector of, co um, is, is that internal, uh, some internal vector. Um, I can go ahead and build that up. That gives me a differential equation. And that should be the differential equation that does the best job of um, encoding that delay. Okay. Because it's a differential equation, I can get um, I can take that differential equation and I can do the same trick that we've just talked about um, in order to implement that in neurons. Um, and it turns out <laughs> that if you go ahead and scale things nicely in order to just to, um, so when you do the conversion into a differential equation, there's a certain degree of arbitrariness in terms of you can, you know, you can multiply all this by two and, and scale things in different ways. Um, and basically rotate these matrices and you'll have the same system. Um, if you scale it nicely such that all the values are sort of in the same range, um, which is nice in order to make this uh, the math cleaner, um, it turns out that not only do you get a fairly nice way of representing what the elements of this A and B matrix are, but it also turns out that these coefficients in here, that the coefficients you get that this X thing is generating are the Legendre basis. That's just weird. Um, it's just, okay, that is um, the, you know, so, so we will automatically have a system that is just gonna go ahead and generate, um, you know, if I use this differential equation, um, it will generate on the fly the correct coefficients for the Legendre basis. And now if I want a particular value at a particular um, from a particular amount of time ago, I can just decode out that value. Okay. And importantly, all of the information across that whole window is stored in those Legendre polynomials, in those coefficients. <sighs> okay, so that's weird. So one, one take-home message is this weird trick of if you have any particular weird thing that you have that you can write in terms of a Laplace domain, um, there is this Pate approximation technique um, that could let you take that and convert it into a differential equation, and then from the differential equation you convert it into neurons. Um, as far as I'm aware, this is really the only example we've done of going through that process, um, but it seems like a particularly useful one um, for if what you want to do is encode, encode all the information about some window in time of my past. Okay, so that's a bunch of math. I found when I got introduced to this stuff and was talking to Aaron initially about this stuff, I got a little bit lost. I wanted to actually sort of see what that looked like. And since we've got all that math, and it's just a differential equation, let's go ahead and implement this. So again, in the notes, um, there's a little bit of code that is just sort of, all right, here's some code that generates those A and B matrices, according to, um, you know, according to Aaron's math, where he went and derived this stuff. Um, so we're just, that'll just generate those A and B matrices. This is going to take those A and B matrices and do the conversion that happens in Nengo when we want to say, oh, hold, hold on a second. Um, or sorry, in the neural engineering thing where we say, hey, I have a differential equation. I need to convert this, implement this using neurons. Um, I need to multiply by the time constant of my low pass filter and I need to add it in the identity. Um, so fine, I've got a little helper function to do that. Um, 
and we need to figure out okay the output of this network or sort of the information coded in this network is going to be the legendre coefficients just looking at those coefficients isn't going to help me much what i would really like to do in order to check whether this works is do something like um let me decode out what was the value one second ago okay. in order to decode out what was the value one second ago what i would need to do so if, if so if this is um how everything you know if what we're doing is we're representing these six values okay, and if and the whole point of using a bunch of values in order to decode out uh, in order to represent a function is now i can do something like oh well if i want this point in time right, then all i need to do is take these six weights multiply each of them by whatever this weight is and that's one for each of them and add that all up so if i take my six values and add them all up i get the value uh, for right now if I take these six values and so that was sort of for zero seconds ago all the way here that would be for uh, one second ago okay so that would be so if I'm taking um, all the odd you know I'm taking this coefficient and multiply it by one this one by minus one this one by one this one by minus one this one by one and this one by minus one right that's just these values and I add that all up and now I should get the value from a second ago if I want the value from a half second ago, then, okay, the scaling factors are a little bit different. They're whatever the Legendre polynomials are at these points. So this is a nice little helper function that just uses that, you know, NumPy has the Legendre polynomials built in. Cool. All right. We will just go ahead and um, use that in order to figure out those coefficients. Um, and that'll give us our scaling factors. And now we can go ahead and just build up a network where all we need to do um, let's generate those things we build an, 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 uh, an input ensemble we make an input connection that multiplies by that matrix we make a recurrent connection that multiplies by this matrix um, and then our output multiplies by our decoder matrix Okay, that's a little weird, um, um, but that's fine. <laughs> um, I will note, of course, you know, what, one thing to remember is when I say I want to have the transform be this particular matrix, I'm not saying that's what the connection weights are. I'm saying, please decode, find the decoders, find the connection weights for the function that is the identity function times this matrix. Um, but again it's just totally normal we're just solving for decoders um, so so these these things are not our connection weights they are being used in order to help compute the connection weights because we want the function that is the identity function times that matrix so what's that look like in mango so i'm not going to type that all out i've already copied and pasted it over into this little network so this is just the same code that we were just showing okay. and it builds this nice little network here I have an input um, I have let's just start by looking at that group of neurons there so um, and let's let's grab this whoa pause move this slider there we are all right so here, now I'm in control of my input. If I feed in zero into this thing. All right, the past history of zero is zero added, being added onto everything. All right, so, so again, what we're plotting here are the six. Yeah, so Q is six. So that means we're using six Legendre polynomials to represent the past history of our input. Okay. Um, and if I feed in zero, fine. A weighted sum of zeros seems to be a good way to represent that let me feed in one okay so first of all there was something weird that happened when i moved the slider but once i'm stable this seems about right my first coefficient is going to be 
a 1, and the rest are going to be 0. Again, this is my set of basis functions. My first coefficient is this top blue one. So that's saying, okay, cool, the past history is just a constant, nothing changing. So all of these other functions are going to have a weight of 0. My top one's going to have a weight of 1, um, or whatever I want. Okay. Now, of course, when I change this, let me do this. Let me say, all right, so we're there, and I'm going to change it. Okay. Um, okay, so, so I've, I'm showing about two and a bit seconds across this window here, um, or maybe just under two seconds. Let's make it two seconds. Uh, sorry. All right, so there, that's two seconds. So there's two seconds across that window. At this point in time, the past history is just, oh, okay, yeah, it's been a constant for the last while. At this point in time, the past history was, oh, yeah, it was a constant for the last while. It's just a different constant. Okay. In here, you know, at any particular point in time, um, our internally represented value is some set of coefficients, <laughs> um, which should be indicating exactly what was going on in the past there. Now, let me actually pull up a value plot. So this is going to be da, 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 too many things. There we are. So let's just also plot the input. I'll go ahead and move that. So I'm going to leave the input constant for a while. And then I'm going to move it. Okay. So at this point in time, the past history was kind of flat. At this point in time, the past history was kind of flat, but these points in the middle, the past history was, uh, it changed a bit. Okay. These things here are the coefficients of the Legendre polynomials that indicate that change. How good are they? Well, let's actually, you know, I do also have this output that is take these coefficients, because remember, these are things, this is all encoded in a bunch of neurons. There's 500 neurons in here that are encoding this information. Um, if I could go ahead and say, all right, what did it end up plotting when I asked it, hey, please find me the decoder that extracts the information from a, apparently I've got a 250 millisecond delay. Right, just, I can extract out any information that I want. So give me the information from 250 milliseconds ago. That's sort of what we're seeing here. Oh, sorry, and this, this, I didn't even look at my code. So apparently this code is doing a window of one second. So this is the size of window. This is the time, oops, time constant of neural transmitter. And this is the number of number of Legendre polynomials. Okay. There. Let's go ahead and move it. There. There. So I'm going to change it. Okay. And then what we should end up seeing um, is this bottom curve should be a slightly delayed version, a 250 millisecond delayed version of this top curve. That's hard to see this way, so I'm going to let it continue to be a randomly varying sine wave instead of me moving the signal around. Okay, and now if I go and lay these on top of each other, all right, that's, of course, you know, are they offset a little bit? Well, let's go find out. Scale it back by about 250 milliseconds. And so that is it remembering what was the value 250 milliseconds ago. Exactly the same network, but with a different decoding. I might say, hey, give me a 500 millisecond 
delay. Okay. All right, let's move it farther back. Whoops, wrong one. And there's my 500 millisecond delay. Um, importantly, one thing point is not just remembering what was 500 milliseconds ago, it's also remembering what was 250 milliseconds ago, and 499 milliseconds ago, and 498 milliseconds ago, and so on and so forth. Um, yes, there is going to be something like the bandwidth problem is that if you start changing this input way too quickly, it's not going to do a good job of, of, of exactly recovering that. Right. But if we're changing slowly, It'll do a perfectly good job um, of recovering that information. Cool. Okay, so why was that interesting at all? So, first of all, that's an interesting technique that lets us go ahead and build these things. Uh, I guess in the course notes, we've sort of got some examples of that. Um, the um, so so this gives us a technique for how can neurons represent the recent past history of a signal. Um, that's led to sort of two different lines of research. Um, one of them is the more sort of biological line of research, which is um, cool. Well, we know biology also does this. Do the neural does the the neural network systems that we sort of make using this approach do they map onto biology well? Um, and they do. Um, you end up seeing the same sorts of patterns of in neural activity of, um, oh, you get some neurons that are stimulated later on and some neurons that are stimulated early. Um, so um, so we're, we're getting interesting matches to the biology. Um, and then the other side of that research, which was something that I think uh, Chris Lysmith talked about during his guest lecture, um, is that this differential, what we've done here is we've built a differential equation that is really, really good at remembering the past. And that's something that machine learning people have wanted a lot, right? Machine learning, like there's a lot of people who do um, things like um, neural, deep neural networks for doing language or for doing pattern um, detection over time. Um, and all of those, there's this tendency of, okay, I need my neural network to encode the recent past history. Um, and in the cases where, hey, you've got a pretty good sense as to how long that recent past history is, um, we can go ahead and use this technique with deep neural networks. Right? And we just sort of ignore all of the biology stuff in this course. Now that we have this differential equation, um, we can just go ahead and ignore all of, all of this biology. You know, fine, if we want to implement the, this differential equation using neurons, we could do that, but you don't have to. I could just implement this differential equation. Um, and that really is just sort of a really simple little neural network. Um, and, uh, or, well, I don't, even, I don't even want to call it a neural network because there's there's no nonlinearity in this. This is, a, this is just a linear recurrent system. Um, and it turns out that if you use that as a component within an, a deep neural network, um, there was a bunch, there's a bunch of results that are sort of saying, hey, look, we're actually better than state-of-the-art um, recurrent neural networks on tasks like um, uh, language and pattern recognition. That is a really new line of research. Um, again, I think the sort of the data that Chris was talking about in his guest lecture was maybe like a couple weeks old. Um, I will at least point people at it in these video just because uh, archive um, just because I think that is worth pointing out. Um, I can never remember where it is, so we'll just do it this way. Uh, yes, so that is um, so that's the paper that uh, he was he was citing. Um, and basically laying out how do you take that same differential equation we were just talking about, okay, um, put it w inside a deep neural network, <laughs> um, 
how to um, connect it up to some of the things like attention and other sorts of interesting new things that are going on in, um, uh, in, in the neural network literature, um, and then go ahead and compare that to, um, like it used to be that the standard thing that you would do for doing these sorts of, um, I'm training up a neural network to have an output that is a function of its past history. Um, it used to be that LSTMs were the state of the art. Um, and now more recently, transformers are the state of the art. Um, and what this graph is showing here is that if you have a network of the similar size, so on the x-axis is how big the network is, um, on the y-axis is the loss, so how much error there is. Um, um, transformers were a huge improvement over LSTMs. Um, and this initial data that we're, that is being shown in, in here is saying that maybe these LMUs are giving another big improvement there, mostly out of the big advantage of we're doing a bunch of math to build this recurrent network for this A matrix. Right? This A matrix is kind of like a recurrent neural network, and we're just generating it with math, and that means that we don't have to train this network. Or we don't have to do, we don't have to learn this matrix. Um, it's also the case that this uh, this parallelizes nicely and can be made to be um, can be made to be feed forward in the same sort of way that transformers uh, can be made feed forward. Um, so that's also I've talked about in here. Um, so that's sort of this really weird other direction where this thing that we generated just to sort of answer this biological question of um, how can neurons um, represent the past history of their input. That forced us to think about things in terms of differential equations. Um, and once we had things in terms of differential equations, whoops, I guess we don't have that there. Once we had things in terms of differential equations, that forced us to do this. Um, and then once we had that, it was like, oh, this is not only interesting for biology, but maybe it's also interesting for machine learning. Cool. Um, all right, so that's all I want to say about that. Um, kind of cool results. Um, definitely, I'm excited about the different things going on in that sort of research direction, um, and it's a nice maybe example of um, biology research helping the um, uh, deep neural network sort of uh, machine learning research. And I think that's all I got. Cool. Um, excellent. On our next video or next lecture, we will start... Um, we'll take a step back from this, and instead of talking about time, I'm going to want to talk about symbols and language and how do we, how, you know, we did a bunch of things here. Well, okay, now we can represent continuous functions over time. Cool. All right. How can we represent language? That's going to be a whole new topic, um, and that's what we're going to talk about next week. Thank you very much, and we'll see you later.